All right, well, I will go ahead and get this started. And then as everyone begins to show up, they will join right in with us. Uh, thank you everyone so much for coming out today. Uh, we're continuing on with our series. I know next week there is a, another of Kevin Zobris early, um, sorry, not early serial, this is this webinar. He's doing one on the four horsemen of root rock, which is actually gonna tie in greatly to what we're talking about here today as a natural process of creating early successional, or as I termed it in the, in the title that was shared, early spiral. And, and we're gonna use those two words interchangeably a little bit today. And Mark, we'll go ahead and dive into a little bit more of what these mean. Um, but really what we're getting at is the beginning of a forest. And I, and I actually, I chose the word a genesis for a reason, because when we're talking about forests, while it's not always a linear process because the entire forest doesn't always start over, oftentimes we like to think about them in a linear timeline. And so the genesis is always a, a really good framework, and we all know the word, um, of the beginning of development of a forest. And so we're going to take a dive today into what this habitat type is, who, is uh, a, who benefits from this type of habitat, and how can we create it. Um, so with us today, we have Associate Professor Dr. Mark Swanson. Uh, he's a very good friend of mine. He was my advisor through my master's degree at Washington State University. Uh, and really inspired me into the career that I ended up in today. So Mark did his doctorate at the University of Washington. Go Cougs, I gotta say real quickly. Um, uh, he worked down in Southern Chile in the Rio Condor uh, in the area of the Tierra del Fuego, which I'm probably messing that word up. Uh, Dr. Swanson is currently the program leader uh, for the forestry program at WSU, where he teaches several courses uh, he teaches civil culture, forest and arid land ecology, and a disturbance ecology class, and actually several others when the time serves. Uh, he serves as the faculty advisor for the Society of American Foresters Club and is a co-researcher on several forest research plots throughout the West, including Mount St. Helens and their post-eruption zone, where much research has taken place over the last few years, really opening the door to our understanding of early successional forests. Mark was the lead author on the paper, The Forgotten Stage of Forest Succession, an early successional ecosystem on forest sites. So he really is one of the best and most um, knowledgeable subject expertise uh, on early succession for the Pacific Northwest. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Mark Swanson. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, Sean. I appreciate it very much. And hello to everyone out there. It's really a pleasure to join with you, even digitally here uh, over Zoom. Uh, I hope you're all doing well in, in these challenging times. And I'm really excited to talk to you about early serial ecology. Now, um, Sean, I'm not going to monitor the chat. I need to minimize that so I can see more of my screen. Can you go ahead and monitor the chat? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Uh, great. I'll stop video to help with the broadband, um, but now you've all seen me, you can envision me. Uh, can everyone still hear me okay? Do, is the sound going to work for us here? And Sean, check that, uh, check that chat feed for us, please. Sounds good on my end. No, there we go. We got a couple of yeses coming through. Okay, fantastic. So if you have trouble hearing, go ahead, get it into the chat. Sean is going to, uh, Sean is going to be my sentry on that. Um, so thank you, Sean, for doing that. And also for coordinating this webinar here. I think it's a wonderful service that Forestry Extension plays for stakeholders region wide. And I mean region wide. I see Oregon, I see Idaho out there in the participant list. So it's great that we have a regional group of people that are passionate about good forest stewardship. Now what I'm going to talk today about is early succession for non-industrial forest landowners, uh, how harvest can play into it, what kinds of habitats can be generated by natural or artificial disturbance, how it can contribute to healthy forests, and the high biological diversity that can occur in the early serial stages of forest development. So without further ado, let's go ahead and just dive right in. What is early succession on forest sites? Well, uh, in most forest disturbance regimes, meaning types of disturbance 
uh, out there in the world of forests. Uh, could be fire, could be wind, could be volcanic eruption. Anything that generates a discrete, large, fairly severe disturbance event, a, a single discrete disturbance event, uh, you have a period before trees again truly dominate the site in terms of percent cover. And we arbitrarily define that as crown closure over 90% or more of the disturbed area. That is the process driven point at which we say early succession is kind of over and we're now shifting into a young forest stand that tends to be very shady and we've moved away from the diverse stage of very early pre-forest succession. So what are the characteristics of this stage before trees again meet crown and kind of begin to shade out the site? Well, herbs and shrubs can be both dominant and diverse on the site. So trees are not the life form that really dominates the site at that stage in development. It's a period of rapid nutrient cycling. A lot of nitrogen is getting fixed by various plants, including members of the buckthorn and pea families. Uh, and Nutrients are also getting transformed. So calcium, phosphorus, nitrogen are getting cycled very rapidly by microbe communities, fungal communities, and higher order organisms. There's an abundance of woody debris and snags. Well, why? It's because we had a forest on the site prior to the disturbance, and the disturbance tended to transform a lot of those living trees into dead trees. Now, far from necessarily being a waste, that actually means we have more of certain kinds of habitat features like cavities. Um, or protective uh, niches for rodents on the forest floor and for many other organisms. And we know a lot of organisms use dead wood to complete their life cycle. It's a time of temperature and wind speed extremes. So the bioclimatic control of the forest, um, the ability to control relative humidity and wind speed and light availability has been relaxed because of that big mortality event associated with the disturbance. Uh, and again, far from being a negative, this means that well, we have certain types of habitat for extremophile plants and animals. So animals that can tolerate extreme conditions often enter the site at this time. And so for all the reasons mentioned above, this can be a stage of high mammal, bird, and insect diversity. So a lot of people are interested in this. We often think of old growth forests having high diversity and they do have a diversity of certain specialists but early in succession, we also have a really rich phase of high biological diversity. So just to review succession uh, in systems that experience what we call stand replacing disturbance, meaning a disturbance that kills most of the trees on a site. We start with the disturbance event, then we move into this early serial or pre-forest stage or pre-canopy closure stage. Then from there, we go into a young stand or what foresters often call the stem exclusion stage, when those young trees have met their crowns and are beginning to shade out the other vegetation. From there, we shift into a mature forest, often where the understory is, is reestablishing again. And then as the forest matures further, we get more snags, woody debris, large gaps, uh, things like that. And we enter the old growth or complex phase. Now in production forestry, there's a lot of focus on the disturbance, often via timber harvest. And that initiates uh, the pre-forest stage, which foresters uh, tend to shorten a bit by planting trees. They, they really have an objective of expediting the development of that young stand, then getting through that young stand into the early phases of the mature forest, at which time one harvests again. So production forestry tends to focus on those early stages. Now environmental advocates uh, tend to focus on conservation of mature forests through the old growth phase. So especially from the 1970s up through the 1990s and even today, there's a lot of emphasis in the environmental community on the later stages of succession. But ecological silviculture, which a lot of people in, in various companies and in government agencies um, or on family forests tend to emphasize, um, ecological silviculture tends to encompass the entire sequence of these stages. Now I'm going to I'm going to kind of move through this slide pretty quick. I just want to note that early in succession in this early early serial pre-forest stage we have a lot of processes. You can see there's trophically complex, a lot of nutrient activity related activity like nitrogen fixation, a lot of woody debris, and then herbs and shrubs tend to be diverse. And you have a lot of that same sort of process late succession in the complex or old growth stage. 
But notice what's emphasized in that young stem exclusion stage. It's when the forest is rapidly accumulating biomass, you have competition mortality between the trees, and it's in a condition of crown closure. So it's a relatively simpler set of processes that are operating in those middle phases of forest development. And a lot of the biological richness is occurring both early and late in the successional sequence. So just, I just want to make the point that it's not just late in successional development, but also early in successional development where we have a lot of biologically meaningful processes. Now, why is this stage of the early serial preforest so variable uh, and so biologically rich? Well, one reason is that we have a number of different disturbance types out there operating on the forest landscape. Could be wind, could be insects, could be pathogens, and of course, fire. Fire in Western North America especially is a dominant disturbance type, and it creates a lot of the biologically rich early serial habitat that we have. Now, when these disturbances act on the forest landscape, they're also acting on a number of different age classes of stamps. So that contributes to high variability and richness. You might have a young stand that gets disturbed over here. You might have an old growth forest that gets disturbed over there. And both of those passing through that filter of disturbance generate different conditions. Now, if you have a real large disturbance, that means that that disturbance is acting on different elevations, different aspects, riparian areas versus ridgetops. So there's a lot of inherent diversity in the landscape for different disturbances to act on. And then after the disturbance passes through, you have a bunch of different dynamics associated with how plants and animals reestablish themselves across space. So that also creates a more slowly developing sort of richness in the landscape. And timber harvest, of course, plays a role there. It, it can create different kinds of early cereal habitat that say deer and, and elk and, and uh, birds known as raptors, uh, predatory birds use. It creates a very open phase uh, before those trees uh, are established and close crown and then move into more of that young forest stage. On the other hand, you've got natural disturbances like fire that tend to create very complex mosaics with lots of living material, dead material, uh, variable pathways of redevelopment following that disturbance event. So there's a photo from the Western Sierras over on the right. So all these things together, what the disturbances leave behind as living or dead legacies, or the large extent of the disturbance, or the spatial heterogeneity or spatial diversity of what the disturbance itself did, as well as all those processes occurring after uh, the disturbance, all those contribute to a lot of diversity in the composition, the structure, and the ecological functions of the forest system after that. So here's the, the biscuit fire uh, down there in the Siskiyou Mountains of Oregon, and we're right on the edge of the fire where the fire was starting to decrease in severity. And you can see a real neat mix of snags and down wood and live trees large live conifers like those Douglas firs, and also a number of broadleaf trees, either survivors of the fire or re-sprouting following that passage of the flame front. So you're looking at an incredibly biologically rich uh, post-fire ecosystem right there. Here's an avalanche track. It's not just fire and things. It's also disturbance delivered by a mountain slope and a heavy snowpack. And this is how a lot of aspen stands are maintained uh, generation after generation by repeated passage of avalanches. And so a lot of woody debris, of course, uh, scattered down the avalanche track. And this, this really is a hot spot of biological activity. A lot of mule deer like to uh, spend their spring and early summer in avalanche tracks, feeding on aspen shoots and other non-conifer vegetation. And also, this kind of disturbance acts as an influencer of other disturbance types. This can act as a cross-slope fire break, modifying how fire behaves in the broader landscape. So disturbances feed on each other across time and space to create yet more diversity. So if you were to get under the shrubs or the regenerating trees of an avalanche track, you'd find an incredible diversity of flowering plants. Now, this is just a sampling of plants you'd find, say, in the North Cascades under the dense slide alder. Uh, some of you might have done hikes up through avalanche tracks with slide alder. And you get under there, you get an awful lot of plants that are important to birds, to insects, and to bears. Bears go into these places and dig up the roots of a lot of these plants as a food item. 
Now, volcanic eruption is not out of place in the Northwest. We have a string of Cascadian volcanoes that tends to erupt fairly frequently up and down the Cascade chain. And uh, there's no better recent example than the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. This event taught scientists an amazing amount about how disturbances don't just destroy, but create the stage or set the stage for biological diversity. And really that eruption didn't eliminate very much from the blast zone. Um, most plants and animals managed to persist or recolonize in short order after that event. And the slow redevelopment towards a closed forest landscape has meant that an incredible diversity of plants and animals, including some animals that are ordinarily not found west of the Cascade Crest, could colonize that Mount St. Helens blast zone environment. So here's an example of, of the richness that can come from intense disturbance. This is the Meadow Lake area along the Windy Ridge Road at Mount St. Helens. And this has one of the uh, highest vascular plant uh, diversities ever uh, noted in the scientific literature. And we had in one 250 meter squared plot, 70 or 75 species of herb, 13 species of shrub, and seven species of tree. So that's pretty incredible levels of diversity for just a, uh, an eight meter radius plot in the temperate zone. So pretty incredible levels of diversity. It's because most everything survived from the previous forest in one way or another. And then it was joined by a number of plants and animals that are disturbance dependent. So we can imitate this in our own tree farms or uh, forest properties when we disturb uh, using silviculture or timber harvest, uh, but we keep some of the plants and animals from the previous forest uh, stand in one way or another by retaining uh, live trees, dead trees, down wood, um, undisturbed areas of understory. Um, but we also disturb the canopy enough where disturbance dependent plants and animals can come in. We actually can create tremendous biological richness. And so these are some of the lessons that Mount St. Helens taught us from that 1980 eruption and the 40 year period since. So one important thing that St. Helens taught us was the uh, role of biological legacies and their value. The fact that when nature disturbs stands, a lot of woody material is left behind. And this is a boon for animals like uh, blackback woodpeckers or, or uh, three-toed woodpeckers that come into these sea of, seas of snags left by fire, for example, or the tremendous amount of down woody debris left by a windstorm, and they now have a tremendous amount of insect material uh, to feed on, and those insects are there feeding on the woody material from these recently killed trees. So disturbance and the woody debris it leaves behind can generate incredible diversity of these animals, these food chains uh, among uh, the invertebrates and the vertebrates. It's not just the animals, it's plants as well. When you allow full sunlight to come in or close to full sunlight to come in from some sort of disturbance, either natural or silvicultural, you can have much higher plant diversity than in the shady, cool understory of the undisturbed forest. So we still need those shady, cool, undisturbed understory somewhere in the landscape, but a landscape that's only comprised of shady understory conditions won't generate the highest plant diversity. And of course, that plant diversity drives a number of important functions. Uh, that plant that you see with the, those big racemes of purple flowers are lupin. So maybe a lot of you know lupin from uh, across uh, the Northwest or across the Northern Hemisphere in general. And one of its major ecological roles is to take atmospheric nitrogen and fix it into a plant available form. And so it's after the disturbance when a lot of nitrogen comes back into the system. So the fact that you have growing conditions for nitrogen fixing plants uh, means that you have an influx of a limiting nutrient into that ecosystem. Shrubs also can come in and many shrubs are very important as forage for animals or they produce flowers or berries or other resources that are critical for many species of wildlife. And some of the shrubs also are nitrogen fixers or they're concentrators of other elements. For example, maples tend to concentrate calcium and phosphorus. So that, that's a, a soil enriching role of an early cereal plant. And there's some flowers and fruit resources. So nectar, pollen, um, all those are important resources for a number of invertebrates and furthermore helps generate uh, energy for the entire ecosystem. 
And it's not just invertebrates, you've got things like hummingbirds that are also utilizing these flower and fruit resources. Now, if you've walked in a shady forest understory in the closed forest, you might see a lot of the plants that uh, are also present in early succession, but they won't be flowering or fruiting at the same level as in an open sunlight condition because they don't have the photosynthetic resources to produce as many fruits and flowers. And a good example of that is huckleberries. If you all like to gather huckleberries, you can have a lot of huckleberry in the shady understory of, of a mature forest, but it's only following disturbance and an opening of the light environment when it really begins to flower and fruit at high rates. And that, of course, is going to benefit birds, bears, and uh, people. So Native Americans used huckleberry areas uh, as a late summer uh, food gathering resource and they would characteristically burn them off in late summer after they're done gathering berries so that trees wouldn't encroach and shade out those huckleberries. Now, all, the, all these plant resources also lead to high bird diversity. So you've got things like woodpeckers that are feeding on beetle larvae uh, that are mining galleries through the dead wood that the disturbance left behind. And this is particularly true of fire. So three-toed woodpecker or um, blackback woodpecker, these woodpecker species are very dependent upon disturbance uh, to provide them with conditions under which they'll build up to maximum populations. Mountain bluebird, they like to feed on the insects and uh, uh, vegetation resources of the post-disturbance ecosystem, but they also need snags with cavities so that they can nest. So that's a really good example of a bird that really likes early cereal conditions with both early cereal vegetation as well as the deadwood legacies from the pre-disturbance system. Lazuli buntings are very similar. Uh, and then a number of raptors, hawks, kestrels, they're pretty happy with all those snacks to perch on, but open areas through which they can uh, soar and fly in search of prey. Birds like flycatchers or kingbirds, they need a perch like a snag, as you can see in the central picture there. Um, we have this snag and I noticed this uh, flycatcher here, and that's a dusky flycatcher sitting on top of that snag that I caught with a zoom lens. And it loves the insects that are being produced by all that abundant early cereal broadleaf vegetation. Black -headed they love the, uh, the fruits and seeds that are being produced by shrubs and grasses and, and other plants out there. They love open foraging areas, but they need a few live trees left behind either by the forester or left behind by the disturbance. So disturbances don't tend to kill every last tree in general, and it's those residual live trees that a bird like the black-headed grosbeak is going to go key in on as a perching post from which it can broadcast its territorial songs and also spot predators coming and so forth. And a lot of songbirds need open space with broadleaf shrubs or trees. Uh, this little spotted towhee, for example, really likes broadleaf shrubs or trees scattered in kind of an, an irregular manner throughout a disturbed area. And then a lot of folks might like grouse, turkey, and quail, uh, other huntable birds, but they're pretty uh, even out, even aside from the hunt, they need open areas for foraging and for breeding. And for breeding, that means open space to lek or to strut. So they, they often have ritualized breeding activities that um, are better out in open areas. So here's uh, a blue grouse uh, here in North Idaho that uh, is out there using a post-fire environment uh, to go ahead and strut and uh, attempt to attract some mates. Now, a lot of these animals really need multiple things from the early cereal environment. A good example is the northern hawk owl. It needs snags as nesting and perching structures. It needs long sight lines so that it can spot its prey. It tends to be more of a daytime hunter. Um, and then it also needs the prey itself. And you've got a lot of rodents that increase in abundance in the grassy or forb dominated conditions of the post disturbance forest site. So when you burn off the forest, uh, you tend to have a lot of grasses and forbs that come in, the vole populations build up, and the hawk owl is pretty happy. Now, it's not just birds, I know I've been spending a lot of time on birds, but also ungulates, so bighorn sheep, mule deer, uh, rock mountain elk, the wapiti. All these animals really tend to do well when shrubs and forbs increase in abundance uh, at, in the post-fire or post-disturbance ecosystem. 
So it could be Mount St. Helens uh, in that blast zone. Elk have done really well there. Could be post fire in the Northern Rockies. And that's what these mule deer that you see here are doing. They're grazing on forbs and shrubs in post fire ecosystems. And close to home, white tailed deer. We've got a lot of white tails here in the region where we live and especially does uh, that are reproductive. Um, they go through that uh, pregnancy and then, uh, then they're into lactation. And those are both extremely demanding from a nutritional standpoint. They need a lot of energy to help that fawn uh, carry through, get born and grow into a, uh, a healthy adult. And they go into disturbed areas for a lot of those resources. And of course, bucks as well. To grow the best set of antlers, you need optimal nutrition, and they're gonna look for open, uh, open full sun, uh, high nutrition environments as generated either by agriculture or generated by forest disturbance. Good example from the west side is the Tillamook burn down there in Oregon in the early 30s. And black-tailed deer uh, exploded to record numbers per unit area after the Tillamook burn. They went up to about 60 deer per square mile in some areas uh, in the decades following the Tillamook burn. Now, Oregonians viewed the, uh, the Tillamook burn as kind of a disaster, obviously for timber resources, but they'd go huckleberry picking, sightseeing, and deer hunting in the Tillamook burn as well. So implicitly, they were acknowledging some of the value of the early cereal forest environment. So uh, the Tillamook burn filled up with a lot of broadleaf vegetation because foresters couldn't get in there and get conifers in the ground. Uh, and that broadleaf vegetation really was a boon to those black tail herds. And here in the Northern Rockies and across Northern Washington, we have montane ungulates like mountain goats and bighorn sheep and burned areas do tend to be good migration corridors and winter habitat for these animals. They've got long sight lines, so they can spot predators. They've also got non-conifer forage, um, you know, grasses, forbs, shrubs uh, that help them achieve optimal nutrition as well. Now it's not just the the hooved animals, but also predators can do well. And lynx, we've learned, will often go into post-fire envir environments during the summer because that's where the snowshoe hares go. The snowshoe hares go in there and follow the profusion of herbs and forbs uh, as summer forage, and the lynx will follow them into the early cereal habitat. And then in the winter, everybody goes back to the old growth forest because of the protective role of the old growth canopy in capturing snow and providing hiding cover from winter conditions. So they all go back into the old growth for the winter, but that early cereal forest habitat is important during the summer. And later on, of course, if you have a large intense disturbance that if, if we have enough biological diversity in the early cereal phase, that can help set the stage for biologically diverse late cereal forest, maybe even help it develop faster. So whether your concern is woodland caribou, spotted owls, or lynx, early cereal uh, in a complex sort of structure can help set the stage for real high quality and quicker developing late cereal forest. And let's get back to the invertebrates. Lots of butterflies. I don't know if we have any butterfly fans out there as well, but uh, the Lepidoptera do well because you have such a diversity of vascular plants out in the post-disturbance site. And this is true of logging as well as fire and other natural disturbances. Uh, a lot of butterflies tend to achieve population highs in those more open settings. So they'll go in there, they'll, they'll lay eggs on their host plants for the larvae. Then when the um, mature adults come out of, of the pupil form, they go nectar in the flowers, as you can see with that tiger swallowtail there on a penstemon, uh, they'll go find the floral resources as an adult nectaring resource. So the Lepidoptera do just great in disturbed uh, forests. And the Lepidoptera, by the way, that's uh, moths and butterflies. Sorry, I, I should uh, put the non-scientific name out. Moths and butterflies, they do really well in these disturbed settings. Even rodents. Uh, a lot of the pocket gophers, voles, uh, deer mice, they tend to do pretty well in early cereal settings. So good examples from coastal Oregon. Um, areas that had been burned off habitually by the Native American tribes and later maintained by homesteading, grazing, and use of fire by, uh, by European American settlers helped conserve, for example, uh, the fairly rare black pocket gopher. 
They're in coastal headlands and uh, valleys of coastal Oregon. So that's a good example of how non-forest conditions, as maintained by disturbance, can help conserve a relatively rare vertebrate. And also the Oregon silver spot butterfly is also conserved in these perpetually burned or disturbed areas. So you get two rare species for one and possibly more in some of these areas. Now, if you disturb things again, uh, that often knocks back the woody vegetation like the shrubs and the trees, and it turns the site over to more of the grasses and the forbs, which are non-woody. So um, to have some re repeat disturbances here and there actually helps increase landscape diversity of uh, plants and sometimes even animals like the raptors. Soaring raptors like red-tailed hawks really like it if a place gets disturbed again and again to maintain those open conditions for soaring and hunting its prey on the wing. And also, if you're an ectotherm, meaning an animal that really relies on the sun to warm you up, uh, like lizards and snakes, you also like these repeatedly disturbed sites because you're not going to do really well in a heat sense, in a body temperature sense, in the closed forest environment. Now, it's often good to have some of this complex disturbed forest adjacent to mature forest. A lot of animals will actually switch back and forth between these habitat types to get everything they need out of the landscape. Spotted owls in Oregon and California are like this. They'll often go uh, roost or nest in the old growth, but then they'll move into the early cereal to hunt things like dusky footed wood rats. So having a landscape mosaic of these different types will actually enhance the habitat for some critters. Or Vox's swift, which is a little swallow relative. They like snags in the old growth forest um, for roosting during the nighttime, but then during the day they'll come out and feed in open areas, especially if it's kind of moist, productive open areas where you have a lot of insects. Bats, same thing, though, except they just uh, switch day and night. Bats come out at night and feed in the open areas, then they'll go back into the old growth or mature forest during the day and they'll find snags that have good roosting habitat for them. And there are a number of uh, invertebrates that do this as well. Won't bore you with the details. But the point is, is that a healthy functional forest landscape has all these age classes of forest structural stage within them. And last, last thing I'll note here as to function is that in a time of cl uh, climate change, things are getting warmer. If we have disturbed areas up and down the elevational gradient, then we're providing an opportunity for uh, trees, for shrubs, and for other organisms to actually shift. So they're doing some migration on their own. We can help it a little bit along as well. If we see a trend, maybe plant ponderosa pine a little bit higher. But disturbed sites, whether disturbed by silviculture or disturbed by natural disturbance, are an opportunity for the forest to adjust its composition in response to ch changes in climate. All right. So now I can kind of conclude my talk with some approaches for non-industrial private forest landowners. So how can you take some of this knowledge about early cereal forest habitats and apply them on your property? Well, one thing we can do is what we've done for a long time, which is traditional harvesting and site prep. So it's still a valid approach for certain values, like getting your forest back into a productive timber condition, getting a thrifty, young, productive stand of a commercial tree species established. So you can see here they've clear cut, they've done a broadcast burn to um, consume organic material and to deal to some degree with competing vegetation. Then you go ahead and you plant your new crop of a commercial tree species like Douglas fir or Western larch. So you can do some of this on your property and then maybe in other parts of your property where you harvest, you might wanna do um, some more ecologically oriented harvesting where you retain more material, down wood, snags, uh, living trees, that sort of thing. Now, this traditional harvesting and site prep can produce a flush of forage for things like elk, so it can have offshoot ecological values. Now, you could also create some gaps of variable size, and many of you might be thinking about this. Maybe a small harvest over here, slightly larger harvest area over there. Uh, gaps even less than a tenth of an acre can enrich the understory, like you see in the photo here very small gap created by a forest landowner, but there is an increase in lupin, arnica, and other uh, relatively light-loving species here. So even a small gap 
can diversify your understory vegetation. Gaps that are uh, a tenth of an acre to half an acre, uh, you could get some shade intolerant tree regeneration, as well as, of course, some shade tolerant trees like grand fir or cedar coming in. And this is where we start to see uh, ungulates starting to use the place. So deer and elk might start to use gaps at about that size for foraging. Birds, bats, um, they're gonna find those gaps and they're gonna feed. So you might get flycatchers perched on the edge of the gap and they're flying around catching insects in the middle of the gap. And again, bats will do that at night and in the early morning as well. You create some gaps that are greater than a half acre in size, up to two, three, four acres or more. Now you're gonna get a good shrub, forb, or grass response, maybe sometimes too much. You might have to control that competing vegetation to get some trees started. And you're also gonna get an increased wildlife response. And uh, especially if you retain some living trees and some dead trees in various forms. So you don't have to create harvest units of all one size. You can get a mix of effects and a mix of early cereal values with harvest gaps of variable size. And uh, among the creatures that use some of these gaps are wild turkey. They love to get into some of these gaps with more insects and, and uh, other resources and uh, scratch around and feed. Now you could retain some live trees, whatever size of harvest unit you're gonna go with. Uh, retain some dominant or co-dominant trees, some larger ones, because uh, they're a little more naturally wind firm. They're gonna be a good seed source. They, they did well at, at growth rates during their life, so you know they're probably gonna provide good genetics for the next generation of trees. And they're gonna be high perches for uh, birds like that black-headed grosbeak or raptors or, or other critters that like to get up high in the canopy. You might wanna retain some smaller trees, intermediate or very small individuals for diversity, as well as for hiding cover for animals at ground level. And leave these things in, in a regular pattern. Maybe some uh, leave islands or aggregates as we call them in one part of the unit and then some scattered live or dead trees in other parts of the unit. Mix it up spatially and you're gonna get more of a diverse response from native plants and animals. And you may even wanna consider keeping some live trees for multiple rotations. Let them get real large and um, you'll have some of that late cereal structure all the way through the rotation. Now you could also retain some live trees with some defect. Here's a grand fir, uh, about 20 inches in diameter at, uh, down at breast height, but it had some rot pockets from uh, Indian paint fungus. And who benefits from some defect like that? Well, it's things like hairy woodpecker, like you see here. This hairy woodpecker um, has found in, you know, either found or excavated its own cavity in there, and it has a very nice nest cavity in there. So got to watch this, uh, Harry Woodpecker and its mate flying in and out uh, all day out of this grand fur snag in a harvest unit. So this was a harvest unit on Idaho state land and uh, they retained this tree with some natural defect, a rock cavity in it, and uh, get, it's getting used by the wildlife. You could also retain some dead trees. So here's a, a dead grand fir with some uh, pouch fungus on there, uh, clearly showing that it's dead. And here's another Harry Woodpecker that is actively foraging uh, on the beetle larvae that are active underneath the bark. So retain some dead trees. Snags may not look the prettiest to all people, but um, there's real beauty in a dead tree for someone with a bit of ecological understanding, that there's a lot of biological activity occurring within dead trees. A lot of fungus, bacteria, viral particles, uh, invertebrates like uh, beetle larvae that are one way, and lots of other organisms that are using dead trees. Uh, we really have come to think of them as as uh, as alive uh, as a living tree. And of course, some downwind debris. When a tree falls to the forest floor, its ecological role is not done. A uh, good example of that is black bear foraging. Here's a piece of downwind debris that's been torn apart by a black bear in search of carpenter ant larvae. So retain some of this material and you're going to benefit a diversity of animals from pileated woodpeckers all the way up through things like black bear or grizzly bear. Now here's an example. Uh, here's a harvest unit on the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. They have a few islands of undisturbed uh, forest habitat. They've scattered some living trees throughout the rest of the unit. And then there are some areas where you have a, high, a higher abundance of downwoody debris. And also some areas where they didn't plant quite so heavily. Not very apparent in the picture here, 
but they might have planted their conifers a little more heavily in one part of the unit and then left other areas to recover to a closed condition a little more slowly. It allows your grass, forb, and shrub communities to develop a little more richly and for a longer period of time. All right, so in, in that vein, you could also vary your planting strategy. Leave some areas at a little bit of a lower density and you're gonna have greater uh, production of wildlife values and aesthetics even for a longer period of time. It's gonna be slower to go back to that closed forest condition. And plant a diversity of tree species, including broadleaf trees. And that's gonna give you a more ecologically resilient stand, which could be good for commercial objectives. If you plant all of one tree and then you get a pest or a pathogen that affects that species, then you don't have much left in your portfolio. But if you plant a mixed species stand or a polyculture as they call it, then you have a better chance of withstanding uh, changes in the pest and pathogen environment. All, last thing, don't try too hard on really harsh microsites, the super wet, super cold, or super dry, super hot areas within your harvest unit. Don't try too hard on those. Plant them once, but if, if uh, the planting doesn't survive, you can allow those areas to recover a little bit more slowly and generate some of the grass, forb, and shrub components that you want in your landscape. Another thing, and be very cautious here, make sure you get good advice uh, from a consulting forester or some other outfit that deals with fire on a professional level. Um, so big caveat that this has to be managed very carefully and professionally, but fire can be your friend to create early cereal values. Even uh, concentrating your slash in, in burn piles and then burning your burn piles can create little microsites where fire dependent plants can enter the stand. So things like balsam root or um, Douglas's helianthella, those are plants, as well as the lupins, uh, these are plants that really do well after fire has impacted even a very small area of the forest floor. So fire can be your friend to help generate some of these values, even if it's just a pile burn. And of course, you get plants, but things like morel mushrooms, which are famously known to respond very well in terms of producing uh, fruiting bodies after uh, fire events, uh, or even just timber harvest, warming the soil can initiate a crop of fruiting bodies of morel mushrooms. That's one more value, which is both ecological as well as economical uh, or culinary as well for a lot of us who appreciate this sort of food product. Now, another thing you can do once you have your new stand established is to uh, prolong the early cereal phase by doing some pre-commercial thinning. So thinning out your stand and uh, keeping your sunlight on the forest floor for longer. Pruning does the same thing. And also a side effect of pruning is that it can improve wood quality in the resulting trees down at the end of the rotation. And so pruning also permits more light to stay in the understory for longer. So what you're doing is you're delaying the effects of crown closure and keeping a richer non-tree forest understory for longer. You could also girdle a few of your retained live trees a decade or two later. So killing a few of those trees by girdling is gonna create snag habitat and help prolong the provision of that value. All right, and as with any timber harvest or deliberate um, opening of the forest canopy, you gotta control invasive plants. So learn to recognize invasive shrubs or forbs like this uh, Scotch broom out on the Kitsap Peninsula and learn to control them. So this is as true of more commercial management, more intensive forest management, as it would be of ecological silviculture. So control those invasives, or you're gonna lose some of those early cereal values that uh, have been discussed here. All right, let's just look at a few pictures of places where people have tried to create some early cereal habitats based on historic disturbance types. And we'll start over in the of the Hoosier National Forest of Indiana. So uh, historically fire and windstorms would uh, open those broadleaf forests of the Eastern US and you'd get a flush of forbs and young trees and shrubs that would produce quantities of bear and turkey and deer that, that are valuable ecologically and economically. And uh, you, you get things like Eastern goldenrod, which is a, a very characteristic plant 
um, of those disturbed sites, you also would get old prairie plants. So some of these prairies persisted for quite a long time uh, because of Native American fire. And early cereal wildlife openings can help keep some of those prairie plants, like certain of the prairie uh, grasses, like buffalo grass, uh, even in these relatively tree-dominated environments. Here's an open shelter wood. Uh, the Idaho Department of Lands created this. Notice the diversity of, of uh, snags, of downed wood, and retained live trees. And you're getting a lot of wildlife use, even though they've removed quite a lot of the standing crop of timber. Um, I'm going to pause for a minute. Sean, are we getting some comments that I need to respond to here? Uh, we've had one question so far that I was able to answer. We're looking so far pretty good. We will open it up to questions at the very end. So feel free to hold on to them and we'll go into a, a big discussion. All right. Yeah, I just, uh, I just didn't want to miss any, any critical comments at this point. Okay. And uh, for girdling, yeah, you, uh, you often do it with a chainsaw and you want to cut five or six inches of bark continuously around the tree. So think of like taking a belt of bark out of the tree so that you expose that cambium or that growing layer, that greenish white growing layer underneath the bark. And that, that actually kills the tree. So we can sometimes beneficially kill trees and retain them as snags uh, in the forest environment. Yeah, so hopefully that clarifies that. So here's an open shelter wood and uh, accomplished by folks from the Department of Lands. And in this open shelter wood, there were pileated woodpeckers, hairy woodpeckers, um, downy woodpecker. There were uh, red shafted flickers. Um, we saw uh, ravens and crows using this. There, there's evidence of moose, elk, and deer browse. Uh, there's evidence of bear activity. So a rich assortment of wildlife will continue to use this site if you retain some of these critical structures, as well as open up the stand to get that uh, grass, forb, and shrub component down there at ground level. So a lot of winds going on. So it's kind of a win-win-win situation for a stand like that. Now here's a mitigation site uh, uh, performed by Pacificor over in the Lewis River drainage in western Washington. Uh, and elk historically have lost a lot of habitat in the Lewis River drainage because of dams going in, um, basically drowning out a lot of the uh, valley bottom wetlands that they used to use for winter habitat. So what Pacificor did to mitigate for elk was to create these very open stands using timber harvest. So a lot of wood went to the mill, support the timber industry and dependent jobs, but they retained things like broadleaf patches of forest. They retained large conifer um, individuals. As you can see, big conifer crowns retained in a scattered fashion throughout this big harvest unit. They kept a lot of big snags. As you can see in the, in the right background, there are some very large diameter snags that they held onto, dead trees. And they furthermore placed uh, hundreds of pieces of very large woody debris. And ironically, they got those large pieces of woody debris from the bottom of those dam lakes, from the reservoir uh, bottoms. They actually sent divers down with boats uh, to pull some of those old growth pieces of log up out of the bottom of the waters where they'd been preserved by the cold water. And they actually placed them as new woody debris out into this manufactured early cereal environment. And guess what? Elk use this, deer use this, a variety of songbirds use this, and it's pretty incredible engineered habitat. Now they've also pruned and done a low density planting to delay the inevitable canopy closure. And I think they're actually seeking a variance from the Washington, uh, Washington DNR uh, with the assistance of DFW to actually have some areas that will not go back to commercial quantities of timber so that they can retain the open habitat for longer. So that's kind of on the cutting edge of forest policy. Should we allow some variances in certain situations from the requirements of forest practices so that we can create longer lasting early cereal habitat on properties where commercial timber production isn't necessarily the ultimate objective? All right, here's a, an example from the non-industrial private forest landowner world. Um, my, one of my mentors, Professor Harold Osborne, uh, he uses clear cut, clear cut with retention, uh, where he's retained snags and live trees. 
He maintains some areas as open grassland with minimal tree presence. He's done ecological shelter woods or open shelter woods like you saw uh, with the IDL example. In his ponderosa pine stands, he's, uh, he's done thinning to reduce fuels or the potential for, for fire, so creating more of an open ponderosa pine savanna. In the older stands, he does group selection and single tree selection where just a few trees are taken here and there to create gaps. So in a forest landscape managed with this diversity of approaches, there's a diversity of habitats from early cereal to late cereal. Timber is still coming off the land. Resilience against fire and climate change is being generated. And a lot of values, aesthetic, economic, and ecological are being generated by this incredibly diverse approach. And I think this is more the norm than the exception for uh, private forest landowners, for non-industrial private forest landowners. I'm really impressed by the diversity of silvicultural approaches that I've seen on family forest landowners throughout the Northwestern region. So keep it up. Even the old time logging uh, left a lot of snags a lot of large diameter trees that had defect. Um, they certainly didn't replant, so they left these areas to, uh, to regenerate with conifers at their own pace. And some of the most interesting habitats we have now actually were generated by the old time uh, railroad logging of the early 20th century. So if we look to the past, we can often find some examples for the future. So I'm gonna conclude with a plea. Um, Non-industrial private forest landowners uh, possess 360 million acres in the USA. They're often less bound by a variety of factors, whether regulatory or economic, than, than are many industrial or government forests. And so my plea to you is please continue to help create these diverse early cereal habitats for a lot of values. Bears, birds, butterflies, bull elk, bats, etc and also financial and ecological viability at the scale of the entire landscape. And you're also helping create diversity, um, and that's a bulwark against changing fire regimes and against a changing climate. So thank you all for what you do on your ground. Please contact me if you have any questions. I'm happy to talk or correspond with any of you. And again, I appreciate what you all do and your interest in these topics. Thank you. Uh, so thanks, Sean, for moderating. And I think maybe now we can go ahead and uh, open it up to questions. Um, I don't know if we only do that through the chat or if there's also a, an audio component. So Sean, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. That was a wonderful discussion. Uh, the audio functions are turned off for the webinar series. So feel free, if you have questions, go ahead and start writing them in. I always find once the question and answer period at the end gets going that it kind of develops. So we'll see where it ends up. Uh, while we're waiting on some questions to come in, I did write out a few for myself. Um, in the very beginning of your slides, you talked about how forests need to reach a certain percentage of closed canopy. And I think you used 90% as a benchmark for uh, that exiting that serial stage. What about, or how does that change in forests that were maintained as open forests, like our frequent fire ponderosa pine system. Do we still see those stands traditionally reach 90% or what does early cereal look like in those? You know, uh, yeah, that's a great question, Sean. And I think if you look at a lot of the work uh, that uh, Jerry Franklin, Bob Van Pelt, um, Kala Hagman have done, they show that there's a much and I know you know this literature, there's a much finer textured nature to the forest stand. You can actually have small patches, like on the scale of uh, a tenth to a half acre, uh, in those stands of otherwise widely spaced large ponderosa pines. So you often get um, bark beetles killing a cluster of those. So now you have snags, they'll become woody debris, but you also have both increased light in those small gaps as well as increased moisture. Those are xeric forests. They're very dry. And so moisture is as limiting as light for a new generation of ponderosa pine, as well as um, buckbrush or snowbrush or other plants that are gonna also colonize that gap. So you'll find these same dynamics. They're just gonna be much more mixed up with many different age classes at a finer spatial scale. In other words, it's a much finer mosaic in those dry pine forests. So Sean, um, did that answer the question, do you think? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lee, it looks like we've got a question here from Elaine. Uh, what okay. benefits does using old growth logs and debris from the bottom of a reservoir provide you provide using logs and debris from just harvested trees? So comparing these more rotted preserved logs in the lake and the reservoir versus, you know, maybe somebody didn't have the means to go get that and they were able to just cut some down themselves. Is there, is there a benefit to it? Yeah, that's a great question. It has to do with the history of the Lewis River drainage. A lot of uh, the Lewis River drainage is in private hands as well as in the hands of uh, Washington DNR. And, and those landowners do tend to harvest and there's been historical harvest as well. And so a lot of the landscape was in a younger forest condition. So stand ages up through maybe 80, 90 years of age. So the, the advantage of going down into the, into the cold, clear waters of those reservoirs and pulling up those large pieces of wood is that they didn't have uh, as much of that material in the forest stands that still remained in most of the Lewis River. So they, they were creative. They went and found large dead wood where it still persisted in the landscape and it happened to be protected by the waters of the reservoir. So um, they're using that large material and we're talking three, four or five foot diameter um, to enrich a landscape in which most trees were now substantially smaller because of the history of timber harvest. Great. Um, you know, one thing that I've, I've heard a lot of when I've spoken with, with family foresters and people that are, you know, interested in doing management practices or harvest on their property is they always see what the forest looks like afterwards. And when a lot of those machines come through, they trample the plants and they they leave debris everywhere. There's limbs and branches and needles. Uh, I guess my question would be, what benefit do those provide to the early uh, ecosystem, early cereal ecosystem uh, following a harvest? Is it okay to leave that there? Um, that's a great question, Sean. I think in the drier forest ecosystems, the, that kind of small diameter material uh, all the way down to needles can act as fuel. So you may want to work with a consulting forester or uh, an extension forester or so, some other person with some localized knowledge of, of fuel and fire hazards and see if it does constitute a slash um, abatement hazard and then maybe pilot and burn it or otherwise deal with it um, if it is. Otherwise, in the, in the more moist forest environments, uh, that material is going to decompose relatively rapidly and it's simply going to play an important role in nutrient cycling. It's going to release calcium, phosphorus, some nitrogen uh, for the next generation of trees and shrubs. So I think those are the roles that would play. Now in the dry forests, if you've just done a harvest and you have that material and you can use fire as a either pile burning or a prescribed fire, then that actually is useful material because it carries fire to the land and it will help distribute the beneficial effects of fire. So there are a lot of ways to look at that question. But Great. So it looks like Judy's got a question we're all very interested in. What is the purple flower in the photo we're looking at here? Yeah, I'm writing an answer so uh, you all can see it spelled out. Um, that's Hardwell's penstemon in the figwort family. So penstemons uh, often like open habitats. Uh, there's a group of the penstemons that are rock dwelling, so they're cliff face or, or rocky ridge top dwellers. Other penstemons are disturbance oriented. And Cardwell's penstemon was a pretty rare plant in, uh, before Mount St. Helens erupted. Um, maybe it was restricted to dry openings in the forest. But after that volcano erupted and disturbed that big, um, you know, 50 square mile area, Cardwell's penstemon was one of the huge winners. It colonized a lot of the blast zone. And as you can see, it can, it can flower very abundantly out there in that, in that open extreme environment. So yeah, it's one of my favorite plants. Yeah. Very cool. Rocky Ridge uh, uh, in the Mount St. Helens area. So you talked a little bit about it already. I know you talked about the, the increase in birds and butterflies. One thing that really didn't get mentioned was what are the impacts on bees? So if a landowner maybe was wanting to help promote bee populations, which I know are in decline and of a, a serious concern for many people, would opening up a forest, maybe even doing a clear cutting on a small chunk of their land actually help promote bee populations? Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, we're not just talking about honeybees, but there are a number of solitary bees and um, 
you know, thread wasted wasps and ichneumonid wasps and all kinds of um, family members of the bee and wasp family that do really well with disturbance. I can't quite cite the paper, but there's a paper that came out two, three years ago from the Siskiyou region of uh, southwestern Oregon and no northern California, where um, after fire, populations of a bunch of these pollinators, these bee pollinators, um, went up to 20 times what it was in the undisturbed forest environment. So there can be order of magnitude increases in the pollinator guild, as we call it. And I sure wish I had Dr. Jim Rivers of Oregon State University here to further expound on that. Um, but yeah, there's no question that disturbance really benefits these pollinators, but they don't just need the flowers, they also need downwoody debris. And they need downwoody debris that the beetles have bored a number of galleries into. And the reason why is those bees need the galleries because they're secondary users of the beetle galleries. They go in there and hang out um, for their nesting. Uh, so uh, it's, it's complex. You need, you need a number of different resources that are generated by that early cereal environment, the dead wood, as well as the flower resources. So in a word, yes, yes. Um, the pollinator guild, not just the bees, but many others really benefit from um, especially mixed severity. So highly variable severity disturbance, and that can include timber harvest. And if you can do some timber harvest and have a little bit of fire effects in there, that'll help them even more because certain plants that support those pollinators really need the fire component. Fire um, clears away the organic material for some of these to germinate. Also certain compounds, including compounds called keratins, actually seep into the soil after fire. They're, they're compounds that are created by fire. The water now takes them down into the soil and stimulates the germination of a number of these seeds. So, um, there are a bunch of complex effects when we disturb the forest and it all adds up to benefit for things like vertebrates and those invertebrates. Great. Uh, so there's a question here. Uh, it, it ties in, I think, definitely um, related to creating early serial habitat. Uh, but you mentioned doing burn piles and broadcast burning versus chipping. I think there's been a recent push to want to chip down Woody a material following a harvest in an effort to reduce the amount of fire that are, that is present in the fear, or, you know, in the hopes that we're reducing it, potentially getting out of hand. However, Richard made a very good point that this is not a natural process, that we didn't have wood that was finally chipped up. Uh, I would think that actually, just a quick thought to Richard's comment, that at the scale of a chipper, it certainly is not natural. However, we do have some cubicle rot diseases that would have actually cause wood chips to fall off or, or bark uh, fl fluffing off of a tree that would have mimicked something very similar to what we would have seen from a chipper, just not on the, the magnitude of size that we see a harvest event that has been chipped afterwards. But can you talk about maybe if, if chipping would have an impact on the response of, of our early cereal species? And then is there a time when fire would be better to help promote those plants? You know, is it better to burn in the spring and then let them seed in real quickly, or maybe burn in the fall and allow the snow to melt down into the soil and enough groundwater to be absorbed? Yeah, so the chipping thing, I want to respond to that by saying that there's probably not much benefit to chipping material much. Um, you know, you could go a little larger than that, but really what, what fuels fire intensity, meaning heat release? It's the, it's the finer stuff. You know, the, um, the little twigs that are less than a quarter inch, we call those one hour fuels because they take about one hour to come to equilibrium with atmospheric relative humidity. You know, the, the 10 hour fuels, which is, um, you know, up to about an inch between a quarter inch and one inch, you know, that takes 10 hours for those to come to equilibrium with relative humidity in the atmosphere. And then, and then up to the 100 hour fuels, which is one inch to three inches. You know, those are the fuel classes that really drive fire intensity. You get a lot of heat release. How do we start our campfire? Well, you want to find a bunch of kindling because it's kind of the gasoline of woody material that helps us get the larger stuff burning. So I think if there's a role for chipping, you might want to tackle the, you know, uh, 
the crown material, the one hour and 10 hour fuels and some of the hundred hour fuels um, and get that stuff broken down so that it can decay or decompose at a, high, at a quicker rate. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't see much value in chipping large logs, for example. That's not gonna affect uh, resultant fire severity. As those decay, they're gonna, they're gonna become relatively more saturated and they might engage in smoldering consumption or burning, but they're not gonna engage in, in really intense flaming combustion as downwindy debris. So I, I think that's what I would say about, about mechanical treatment of woody fuels. And there's a whole literature on this, including literature written for um, the lay audience. Well, are there any further questions before we go ahead and wrap up this webinar? If anyone has any, go ahead and write in the chat. Uh, while we're waiting to see if anyone has any further questions, I would say that this webinar has been recorded it will be hosted on our YouTube page. Go check out WSU Forestry Extension. And we're gonna be hosting all sorts of webinars and videos into the future. We've got a lot of really cool things on the horizon coming up. Uh, so I haven't seen any further questions come in. So with that, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Mark Swanson for giving this webinar presentation today. And thank you all for coming out and joining in this wonderful presentation. And with that, I wish everyone a very happy and healthy good night. And thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sean.